Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch, culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Jeff Edgers. Uh, Jeff is the uh, he is an American journalist and writer who is a national arts reporter for The Washington Post. Uh, previously, previously worked for The Boston Globe uh, and is the author of Walk This Way, Run DMC, Aerosmith, and the song that changed American music forever. Uh, thank you for being on the show today, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And thank you for clearing up that I am American, damn it. American, an American journalist. Uh, the Washington <laughs> Post's uh, homepage, very, very, very clear on this fact. American journalist. Uh, so I uh, I wanted to have you on the show today uh, to talk about Norm MacDonald, uh, who is or was, I suppose now, one of my favorite uh, comedians. He has a new special out on... Uh, Netflix, a posthumously produced and uh, released uh, uh, special, um, and you have a piece up about that. But I want to I want to go back a few years. I want to go back to uh, the first profile that you wrote of Norm uh, for the Washington Post because I feel like he had something of a resurgence, a renaissance, at least among normal, average viewers, listeners, readers, whatever. Uh, that can be traced back to that piece. I mean, I really do think that was a kind of seminal moment in the reappreciation of Norm Macdonald. How did that come about? Uh, and uh, let, uh, just talk to me a little bit about what it was like sitting down and talking t- to him and to his friends about him. Well, the best stories, I think, are stories that don't have a hook. So you don't do them because you're like, uh, hey, This guy has a book coming out or he has a movie or she's got a special coming out or a record. The best stories come about because you think they should be done. So that's really what I would trace as my best stories here at the Post. You know, whether it's Norm Macdonald or going and doing a profile of Sinead O'Connor, like, I guess, a year and a half before a book comes out. You know, the New York Times did one. They did a phone or a Zoom. I drove down the West Coast Highway for eight hours with Sinead. And so Norm fits that category. I just always thought Norm was one of the funniest, smartest people in the the universe and also kind of misunderstood. There was that, um, you know, sense that he was like a frat boy almost. Like they would make that, people would make the Norm sound like, ah, like that's all he does. But Norm's kind of a genius. I mean, he he really is. Um, And so I just wrote to him. He had just done the Saturday Night Live 40th anniversary special. And I had uh, the first time I wrote to him was I was doing a profile of Eddie Murphy and I was going to go see Eddie Murphy. And Norm had done one of his great Twitter threads about trying to get Eddie to do stuff on the show. Do Cosby, maybe, I think. And so I'd written to Norm and Norm had said, DM me. I DM'd him and he would not talk to me at all. I didn't know him at all. Wouldn't talk to me. And then after the Eddie Murphy story came out, he tweeted something like, I wish I had the tweet still. I probably could find it, but it was like, or he probably deleted it, but it was like, nobody writes about comedy like Jeff Edgers. Please read this story. I was like, what? I thought that was so odd. So I wrote to Norm. I asked if I could meet with him. Said, sure. He didn't really have like a publicist or anything. He has a manager, Mark Gerbitz, who he's had for a million years. He said, come over. And I went over and it was like, he was just at his condo with like socks were on the floor watching TV. And there were all these pages of junk on his coffee table. I said, what's that? And he said, oh, that's my book. It's a piece of garbage. And uh, it was just his book written in um, on yellow lined paper. And so I just started doing that story. And as I said, when I, you asked me this question, the reason these stories work is because nothing is coming out. So there's no deadline. There's no, boy, we have to establish a rapport. There's just like, hey, Norm, I'm back in town. Can we hang out? Oh, Norm, what's going on? Norm, you're going on Jimmy Fallon? Uh, can I talk to you about that? Jeff, why do that? C- come down to New York. You'll, you'll go with me. Uh, so that's what happened. And I'm just so grateful for the rare and almost, uh, you know, that doesn't happen much. It happens once in a while, but I'm so grateful that he uh, gave me that that moment. Did it boost his career? I don't know. I mean, like I was calling TV executives and saying, why does Norm Macdonald, one of the smartest people in the world, one of the most entertaining people in the world, not have a show on your network? So I guess it's like advocacy profilism <laughs> or something. And um, so maybe that put him back in the spotlight. Maybe that gave people. T- but I mean, like, how could you be running something and not want to get Norm on there? Look, our story came out. The story I wrote this weekend about his special came out on Sunday. And uh, 
It was number one on our site for like the whole day. And it wasn't because I'm great, because I it's just a story. It's because Norm has incredible appeal and popularity that people don't really understand. So while there's, you know, Ukraine and school shootings and things that are very important going on, Norm is number one. Yeah, I mean, it really... It, it is and when I say it, it led to a resurgence in his career, I, I don't even necessarily mean professionally. I do. I, I mean this more, again, as like a reassessment uh, of of by regular, you know, regular, quote unquote, regular folks, just just people who, you know, had kind of forgotten about him. Um, and I, uh, and I, 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 again, I, I remember reading that piece and I, I want to talk a little bit about the production of that piece because it's a very interestingly produced story. Um, but in terms of the reporting, how, how long were you actually working on that with him? What, what was the timeline on that? Like, I don't know, a year, maybe a year, year and a half. I, I mean, I did a story on Chevy Chase. That must've been seven visits in a year. Um, you know, I, you'd have to look it up, but like, I went to see him. The first thing I did, I think was go to see him. Maybe it wasn't at his condo. Might have been at Caroline's when he was performing. I remember Josh Gardner opened, I think, opened up. Um, so that, whatever that timeline is. So it's like, you know, that's November of some year. And I don't know when that story came out. But it was like, let's put it this way. The book that that ended up being published right before my profile came out, because I kind of held it a little bit and hung on to it. Th that book was in the form of yellow lined paper with scribbles on it when I started that story. So, you know, considering how long it takes to like actually bring a book to life and edit it and it's a long time. So maybe a year and a half, maybe, uh, maybe more than that, maybe less. I don't know. I mean, it got to the point where I was kind of terrified that I wasn't going to be able to do the story well, because sometimes you work on something for so long, it, it's like psychologically damaging not to just write it. Um, that happened to, Ch to Chevy too. It's just, you want to get the thing down on paper so you don't freak out in your own mind and spin out and go, I can't do this thing. Right. But you know, it was a long, it was a long process, endless tweets, endless, you know, uh, DMS, uh, or endless texting, um, endless communication and, you know, uh, just got us to the point where it was ready to go. Yeah. I, I want to talk about the texting because, again, as I said, it's a very interestingly produced piece. And I, I encourage I'll link to this in the uh, in the show notes and the email that goes out with this pod, uh, podcast. But the the um, the piece itself is really uh, fascinatingly produced because it is, you know, I wouldn't it's not as far as some of these big productions go. It's not super fancy, but it does have this nice little feature where uh, you can click on a little ellipses that pops up from time to time and read the text message conversation that you guys actually had with each other. Uh, what was what was working with the post production team like on that? How how did that come about? Who you know who how how was the uh, the the process there like in terms of integrating it into the story? I don't really remember who suggested it. It might have been me. It might have been one of my editors. I mean, David Mallets, who's um, a great editor. I work with him a lot. Um, he he got Norm. He's like kind of like the uh, story whisperer. He knows when like a story, like he, I'll just say to him, he doesn't say a lot, like he's kind of a quiet person, but I'll say like, ah, I think we should do a big story on Eric Clapton. He's like, good target, you know? And same thing with Norm. He's just like, good target. You know, he knows those stories are going to work right. And I think, I don't know what happened, but I'm always trying to find new ways to tell stories. When I did my original, you know, the book for walk this way was based on a Washington post story, but we ended up building into the design of that Washington post story. I licensed the music from universal, uh, of Aerosmith and run DMC. And we ended up like designing like when Joe Perry would say the beat was something I'd heard that was kind of like the meters. We would have a clip of him of the beat. You know, you could press a play button. So it's always about trying to find a dynamic way to present things and all these genius, you know, designers and producers that we have at the post, how, how they can do that. So the texts really were, how do we show something that I think is really interesting? Cause I always found, you know, it's a very basic rule of writing, but sometimes people forget it's like i would always watch like veteran reporters come back to the newsroom 
when I worked at the Boston Globe because I worked at like in the office. And they'd come back from this thing with an amazing story. They'd be like, blah, 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 blah. And the conductor was doing this. And then they would, you'd read the story and you'd be like, where was that? And they're like, oh, that was just a story I told you. But the story you tell somebody is usually the story you should tell. Like that's the most interesting stuff. Why would you not use that? So when Norm would text me 27 messages on Hanukkah night about some Russian story that he had adapted himself and was like, want to hear a story? I, I would tell my family that, and sometimes they'd find it aggravating, but sometimes they'd find it entertaining. So at some point we decided that should be an important part of the story. And I had to go back to Norm because it's certainly kind of unconventional uh, and say, hey, uh, I want, I, I don't remember exact his exact words, but I, I probably said, hey, I, I want to publish the text messages in the story. And he probably was like, why the hell you want to do that? And I was like, well, they're they're good. They're interesting. You know, oh, OK, well, I don't know what I said. Well, how about we go over some of them? And and uh, if you're uncomfortable with something, we can you know, we don't do that for stories uh, right, right. Uh, because that's against our ethics. We don't allow someone to read a story before it's in. But this was different. This was asking a guy after the fact, basically to put something on the record. And I guess I'm trying to describe it in journalism terms, but it's like basically asking a guy who was texting a guy in his mind in a way that wouldn't be published. Hey, what can I put in there? I don't think Norm said, I don't think he stopped me from putting anything in there, to be honest with you. I think he was cool with everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just as, as far as journalism goes, right. Journalism ground rules, you know, there's, you have conversations and interviews that are on the record, you know, some emails, texts, DMs, right. will be off the record. Uh, and, and I, I think that worked out really well. I just want to, I want to divert slightly away from Norm, uh, just to pay tribute to the folks who were doing this work at the Washington Post. You know, we had a, we had a little tiff with somebody on Twitter who was complaining about the paywall. Um, and, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, look, I, I understand that paywalls can be frustrating, but journalism is expensive to produce sometimes. And you're talking about a you're talking about a story here that took you, you know, a year plus to report. It took several people working on the technical end. Uh, you have editors, you have, you know, everybody else. Uh, don't complain about paywalls. Well, that's just so, I always get into that stuff. Sometimes I buy people the paper. You know, if it's like a really good deal, I'll just buy it for them. My parents are super cheap. They live in Boston and they buy the Boston Globe which is like, I don't know, it's like $400 a year. And not to insult the Boston Globe, I used to work there for years, but it's not the Washington Post. And the Post is like, costs nothing because it's like that Jeff Bezos guy who owns it. His whole philosophy is to like, you know, it's like that Amazon philosophy, like hook them in. And then uh, I don't think he talks like that, but hook them in and then we got them, you know. So it's not that expensive. So I will always say to my mom, hey, did you see that story? Uh, I don't. Did your subscription run out again? Yes. And I buy them another one for like whatever, $49. So I just think it's ridiculous. The idea that what we're doing should be free. I, you know, I got, a, uh, uh, who was it? Adam Sandler's publicist. I like, you know, she's nice. Adam Sandler will never talk to me or any other human that might ask a question with more than <laughs> eight syllables. You know, even for this story on Norm, he's not available. He's flying. He's not, everybody has 10 minutes. Trust me. Last in last year, I talked to, for Sean Penn profile, I talked to President Clinton on the phone for 20 minutes and Warren Beatty. I think that Adam Sandler can make seven minutes to talk about Norm. But uh, I sent her the story and she wrote, oh, it's behind the paywall. And I'm like, I felt like saying, you're a professional professional. How can you not have a subscription to one of the top two papers in the country. How could you not? It's just ridiculous. I, this stuff costs money. I went out to California. I flew out there. I, I stayed in a hotel. Uh, it was torturous work. I saw Bill Murray, you know, like I had to eat food. Uh, and then I came home and I had to call people and uh, phones aren't cheap. And then I had to, you know, write a story up and my, you know, I'm very highly paid. I make more than six fifty an hour. So, uh, it's just like, how can you not expect to pay for something there? That was good yeah. paywall whining yeah. conversation, good. right? I, I am pro paywall whining. People need to know. Uh, and I mean, look, if Adam Sandler never talks to anybody, I guess you don't have to subscribe to anything because you, you're never going to have to read right. what he doesn't say. Except so, for TMZ uh, or something, right? I, I would, I, it, it is funny that you mentioned that about Sandler because you really don't ever see him. He seems very uncomfortable doing 
press, whatever. That's neither here nor there. Let's talk about the new special because uh, that that was your that that's the new piece. That's what we're here to talk about. Uh, did you? I mean, look, I I it was it was not widely known that he was not well. Um, uh, did you have any idea? And were you surprised when this uh, this new special dropped? Not widely known. That's a nice way of putting it. You know, I texted uh, Roseanne Barr last night, right? Because I saw uh, Roseanne was real close to Norm. He wrote on her first show and her second show. And um, I just have her, I have her text. And she said, I mean, she said a lot. But the first thing she said was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, like, I guess I should have this ready. It's so funny because she, she texted me and I had a good text. And then she texted so much stuff after that, that I lost <laughs> that text somewhere. Uh, but she said, I'm sad to not have been in that circle close to him at the end. I, uh, uh, you know, and she said she would have, um, uh, I wish he told me so I could have prayed with him as I've prayed for many people. And I said, Roseanne, he literally only told his son, brother, mom, Laurie Joe, who's his producing partner and best friend and manager because his manager had to deal with his, uh, uh, you know, stuff. He didn't tell anyone. I mean, no one. It's not like a few people. And, and, and the thing in the story that I wrote was fascinating to me is Norm developed this like kind of comic thing about being a slob, uh, where he would, uh, go on his YouTube show and he would eat lots of chicken and they would make little clips of it. And I talked to the guy who, um, produced those segments after the fact, uh, nice guy, Daniel Kellison, who also works with Jimmy Kimmel and worked with Norm quite a bit. And he said, I did all those productions. I produced all those segments on eating without any idea. I feel like an idiot. And it's just like, but Norm did that on purpose. He was taking steroids and his um, uh, neck and his face was swollen. He didn't look great. I mean, he looked like he'd put on weight and we just accepted mm -hmm. that that was what was happening. But in fact, it was these steroids. And so Norm turned it into a bit. Instead of, I mean, he could have gotten sympathy, I guess, or said, oh, I feel terrible. You know, I'm just battling through this stupid cancer thing. Um, instead, he he got a bucket of fried chicken and scarfed it down and they made clips and, and showed it and made out like he was some kind of uh, slob when, in fact, it was the opposite. It's just so interesting. I've just been trying to wind that through my head as a comedic thing. And I can't totally like it's a completely it's this very specific kind of comedy, the buffoonish, you know, slob guy. But that wasn't actually maybe who he was, or maybe he was a little bit like that, you know. But he was always doing that food thing as if it was part of his inner being. Yeah, it's funny. I remember, uh, I remember when David Bowie died, and and Black Star came out, you know, a couple days before, or after I forget exactly what the time was there. Somebody, somebody, a friend, a friend said something like, you know, David Bowie found out he was going to die and he used that. He was like, how can I use this? And it feels very much like that is what Norm is doing. I mean, frankly, it, looking back now for the last 10 years, almost, I mean, I, you know, from, from the, the memoir novel, um, to, uh, his, his last couple of specials. Uh, what was the, what was the response that you had uh, that you that you got from folks uh, who were who were talking to you about the special, having watched it, and uh, I know you talked to some of the uh, from some of the comedians who took took part in the the I don't know uh, discussion afterwards. David Letterman and um, David Spade and those guys. Uh, how how what what was their take on Norm's response to his own coming demise? Uh, he had no response. He didn't share it with anyone. Didn't tell anyone about it there's been like a couple little like repurposed clips from the new special where they're like, Norm talked about death, you know, on his last special, but no, he didn't. I mean, or like he did a little, but he talked about, I was listening to me doing stand up, which is from 2011. So it's before he was even diagnosed, uh, which he was diagnosed, I guess, at the end of 2012. And then in 2013 underwent a stem cell transplant. So 2011 he's never been uh he, he doesn't have cancer he doesn't have this sense of mortality I, I don't think and he did tons of jokes about death and about this fake thing about his father having a heart attack and falling on the floor his father did have a heart attack he did not fall on the floor whatever something about another uncle who had uh, a colon cancer i guess so um I, I actually don't think norm dealt with death at all on that special except for the fact that he made it, 
I mean, he was going in. Just think about that. You're going in for a stem cell transplant the next day, and you film this entire thing off the cuff. That is the that is how he made an allowance for his cancer. But if he had lived, he would never have put that out, and so no one would have known. So it's it's mm-hmm. it, it's hard to say. I, I was kind of like to be. I mean, have you seen the special? Yes. Yeah. So I was. A, I'm a little, I probably crossed the, 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 the line with Norm as far as, I remember I was in a car with him near the end of my story uh, when I was working that original profile. And he said, Jeff, we're friends, aren't we? And I was like, Norm, we're not friends. I'm r- writing about you. Like, no, uh, we can be friends later. And he's like, come on. I was like, no, no, we're not friends. Um, but I think that I, w- I don't know if I'd say we were friends, but I think I probably felt something for Norm and and felt you know a great uh, appreciation for him that probably crossed the line into like what I probably shouldn't wouldn't have been covering Norm after time passed I wasn't like going to be writing previews of stuff and whatever I just I don't think it made sense um, but you know the thing is I watched that special which is very odd to watch because there's no audience and again I went back and listened to his. Uh, I, I, you could watch it on Netflix, but I also listened to the audio of his other stand-up specials. And, you know, there are pauses, there are responses, there are the natural rhythms of laughter that spark the pace of that show. And it doesn't happen in nothing special. He's just at a computer or at a, at, at a you know, at a countertop doing his thing off the cuff. And it's just a little odd to me at times and I could tell you there are funny things in there and there are jokes that I'm like, God, that's a killer thing. But also I was a little nervous about what the response would be. Like it's, it's a little raw. It's like in some ways it's the equivalent of like um, a musician recording like an entire set of demos for a record off the yeah. cuff before they put it out. But I will say this, Stephen Stills, just roll tape. It's amazing. Like he plays every single song that's going to be on Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young off the cuff. And it sounds incredible. So what I was pleased with, and I know uh, Neil McDonald, uh, who's Norm's older brother, also had this same slight concern. Like, you know, Norm didn't exactly get uh, rave reviews from the mainstream media. God, I I love using that term. Uh, During his lifetime, he was always kind of confused. He confused those people. It was like people on Reddit or like, you know, Rotten Tomatoes or me and you who got it. Not everybody got it. So I was like, hmm, maybe they won't get this or go for it. But the reviews have been really positive and I'm really glad it exists. I mean, I was glad it existed anyway, but I just didn't want to see it get attacked for something it 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 wasn't, which is it wasn't a polished Netflix stand up special. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It is interesting to watch it because you can almost see uh, you can almost see how the bones of a special like this are put together without the audience there. You can see where he knows the laugh lines will be. You can see his his face working. I mean, he does a lot of work with his face, just his eyes kind of lighting up, getting big or, you know, kind of like selling, selling the moment, selling the joke, uh, you know, in a way that um it, to say that it highlights the artifice of it isn't right. To say that it highlights, it's more highlights the performance of it because it is a performance. I mean, stand up is not, you're, it's not a recitation, it's not a oratory. It is a performance. You're interacting with the crowd, and and taking the crowd away kind of emphasizes that. It's it's very interesting. I know in the after the after special discussion, David Letterman seemed vaguely annoyed by this. Like he, he it was it was funny listening to him kind of talk about it. He was like, "Where I I don't." It's a different thing. It's not stand up. It's something else. It's where was the audience? How would the audience have responded to this? You were, you know, you don't, you, you're not getting the test of the audience. And that is, uh, it's a different thing. But it still works. It's very, it's very, I don't know. It's, it's very moving. And I, I mean, again, the, uh, all the stuff with his mother at the end, deeply moving. Uh, I, I was kind of blown away by it. I was not expecting something uh, as raw as it was. Well, tell me what you mean by that, the, the mother material, how much he loved his mother and everything. I mean, yeah, how much he loved his mother. And yeah. it, I mean, it felt, I mean, look, I, again, knowing what we know now, it felt like him saying goodbye to his mother. I like, that is just how, how I read that, that whole last section of the, the, the special. Yeah. Um, it, interesting. Cause I mean, like his mother, who is really wonderful, I would, 
I mean, it really was oversimplifying her, but I mean, like I would describe her to Norm in the same way that I sort of found David Letterman's mother. Uh, although she's obviously not as, you know, David Letterman's mother who'd go on the show and like report from the Olympics. Fern kind of had that role. She was always around. She has a condo in the same complex. She, you know, um, she didn't go to the celebration of Norm in LA. I think it might've been too much to experience, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I might watch it again with that in mind, to be honest with you. The thing about Norm that I always found, I, I sort of reached the point where I didn't believe anything anymore. Um, I remember he told me a story about, um, if you listen to the Mark Marin podcast with Norm, it's very funny to me because Mark Marin, who I used to, I did a story on him. I used to really like Mark Marin, but after I did the story and I saw he is, I mean, it's not like talking out of school. He is a, a narcissist. I mean, he talks about that. I would listen to the interviews in the future and I'd be like, Hmm, he's already got an idea of what he wants to ask before it's been talked about. And so sometimes you'd get a really cool avenue that you could go down and he would ignore it because he already wanted to ask his own thing. But with Norm, uh, Norm tells this amazing story on that podcast about walking down the street in his in in his town and how his father wanted him to te learn, you know, what it was like to be in a blind man's shoes. So he had this he had Norm walk this blind man all the way through town, pointing out things, talking about things. And I just thought, what a weird story. And it clearly like impacted Mark Maron. He brought it up like a couple times. And I said, Norm, I remember we were sitting there and I said, Norm, that story was kind of weird. Did that happen? He's like, no, no, I made that up. It's like, <laughs> why? And he said, well, because I know that when people go on that show, they have to give some kind of emotion or like some kind of like, he's always looking for something special. And I thought, well, I'll just tell him this one. Uh, so, you know, even at the end, like, I think I talked to Laurie Joe and she told me about how Norm's uncle Basil had died of cancer and that he had, Norm had realized that other relatives in the family who'd gone to the funeral had been very conscious of not making people feel like they were mourning. They were uncomfortable with like open shows of emotion, whatever. And then I talked to his brother, Neil, and I was like, so your uncle Basil died of cancer, right? And he goes, no. So really? He's like, no, we had an uncle who died of cancer, but that was, he had already moved away. And I think it was in Baltimore and none of us went to that. I was like, okay. So like it, none of it ever added up. I mean, to me, I knew how much Norm loved his mother because I saw how he dealt with her when she was feeding him his, uh, you know, uh, when she would walk over with a piece of toast with a to tomato or tomato, open face tomato sandwiches and how he would talk about her. Uh, but I, I, I would like to go back and listen to that and see, you know, what what the story is there, because I, I just I'm sort of my brain is turned off to the idea that Norm would have recorded. a. This is how uh, unexpected he, he was to me. It's like the last thing I would expect, expect Norm to do when he has terminal cancer or whatever and might die is do anything that is special based on that other than mm -hmm. if he made fun of cancer, you know, like I, I just, I can't imagine him even on this special. It's like, he theoretically knows that all this stuff that is, is controversial in the world, you know, how Dave Chappelle talks about tr the trans community, um, the me too movement, all these things. And Norm was a little bit of a crotchety, like traditional, like he had a, a little bit of that, like, Oh, women aren't as funny as men thing, which obviously was wrong. But, um, it's not like he said, you know what, I'm going to record this. And the only way it's going to be seen is, is if I'm dead. So no holds barred. I can do whatever I want here. You know, didn't do mm -hmm. that at all. Uh, and, and that was also interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it, it is. I mean, well, the, it, it is interesting to kind of track what he is talking about compared to, you know, what some of the obvious controversies at the time were, uh, which is, again, uh, the the way he tells that the the trans joke in particular is almost a like breakdown of how that whole set of jokes works or doesn't work or whatever. Um, I I uh, I well I I don't know. I mean I'm I, I'm I've asked basically everything I wanted to ask. I it's funny. I I, I did want to ask you one thing about your interview technique because you mentioned Mark Maron kind of going down the avenues he wants to go down as opposed to where where the conversation should naturally go what what are you uh 
what is your interview technique like when you're talking to a guy like Chevy Chase or somebody like Roseanne Barr? Like, what are you waiting to hear or just kind of rolling with in the in the conversation? Well, interviews, because I'm asked this all the time. Netflix just <laughs> asked me. They said, um, they said, hey, uh, Ted Sarandis is very busy. Can he send a statement? I go, no, he cannot. I don't do email interviews. You can't send a statement. This isn't a proclamation. It's a story. And the material that you need for these stories have to be conversations. You know, so sometimes, you know, you're in a tough spot where they say, uh, Bradley Cooper has nine minutes to talk about Sean Penn. So you have to do it. You have to really like know what exactly do I want to get out of this? It usually turns into 17 minutes or 24 minutes. But, you know, with a story like Norm or Chevy or Roseanne or Sinead, those are conversations. Those are not a list of 10 questions that you are going down. With the caveat, there are certain things that need to be addressed. So like take the like kind of white elephant in the room with Norm. It's his wife. He was married, but Norm never talks about that. He'll never talk about it. He would never say, I knew I had to ask him about that at some point. So at some point in his condo, I asked him about it and he made some kind of grumbling noise, like, like he wouldn't even answer with words. So whatever. And, you know, David Letterman, I, I had very, you know, maybe three hours over two days with him. And I remember he told me because it should be a conversation, you're letting the people talk as much as they want to about whatever they want to talk about. And, but his, uh, uh, PR guy was there who's excellent, but also is like very like time's up. So I remember we were about 10 minutes away. We'd been talking forever. And he told me about this story about this comic who like used to be on laugh, laugh in and had like a thing where he'd put a banana in his underwear. And he was just going on and like 40 minutes of conversation about this guy. But that was what Letterman wanted to talk about, even though none of it was going to end up in the story. And I remember when, uh, his guy came over and said, hey, we've got 10 minutes. I looked at the sheet of paper and it was like depression, medication, heart attack, um, uh, affair. I was like, oh, my God, like I have to go over these. Th like, what am I going to do? Hey, lightning round. Tell me about that affair. Oh, wait, tell me about the blackmail. Tell me, you know, it just was uh, like so I said to Letterman, I said, look, um, could I could I give you a call and we, could we talk about there's some other things here I got to talk to you about and I didn't get to. And he said, well, no, why don't we just do it here? And we stayed for like another hour and a half or something like that. But, you know, it really I have like when I was interviewing Colin Quinn for this Norm story, he said, I wish I had just set up a recorder and just taped him talking because he said so many interesting things. And I just wish I had that. And I said, I got that. I got a you know, in my Dropbox, there's 10 hours of Norm talking or walking around or saying things. Uh, there's 12 hours of Chevy Chase, you know? I mean, it's just that's how you get the the goods. you got to get the time. It's not that complicated. It's time and, and, and commitment. Yeah, yeah. And it is often hard to get folks on for that much time. Uh, thank you for the time that you've given me here. I've asked everything I wanted to ask. I always like to close these uh, podcasts by asking if there's anything I should have asked. Is there anything about that you think folks should know about Norm or I, just what you do? What, what's up next for Jeff Edgers? Well, I just work on stories all the time. So that's it. I mean, you know, uh, I can't tell you what they are. You'd steal them, Sonny. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. I uh, but I, I just. You know, I I love doing this. It's what what a gift. What what a lucky thing to be able to work at the Washington Post, a place that puts such a premium on, you know, we're not perfect, but we put such a premium on on these long form stories that don't have to have a hook necessarily. So, I hope people just go back read read everything I ever wrote on Norm because I, I I cared about those stories, you know. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for being on the show. The new special uh, from Norm McDonald's on Netflix now. You can go watch it. Uh, and I will link to uh, all of Jeff's pieces in my email. So you'll, you'll have them right there. You can click right through. Uh, go sign up for a subscription to the Washington Post if you don't have one already so you can read them. Uh, my name is Sonny Bunch. I'm the culture editor at The Bulwark. And I will be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. See you guys then. <laughs>
You loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Normal people don't write negative comments on people's Instagram. Right. They don't have to listen to this podcast. They don't have to buy tickets to come see my show. No one's forcing them to do anything. They're doing it because there's something that they relate to in me and I relate to in them. That Mm -hmm. sends chills all up my body. Yes. Give Them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.